you take your Bible and turn with me today to <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 21. That's where we that's where we will begin today is chapter 21, but we're going to find our text in chapter 23. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to preach uh, two chapters of Second Kings, but I want us to go there. And I've been doing this current Challenges to Biblical Authority series, and today's going to be like all the others. We're going to look at what's going on, what, where it's happening in the church, and then talk about how the Bible speaks to that. So we'll read our scripture just a little bit later. So the current challenges facing the church, what are they? We've gone over several. Uh, the foundational issue we looked at at the very beginning on the first Sunday in January which was the insufficiency of Scripture. That is the problem today, because everything else rests on the insufficiency issue. We talked about that in that first Sunday. Then we examined the current trend of deconstruction. That in modern Christian, uh, postmodern Christian life has become a, uh, a chic thing. You know, it's, it's uh, cool now to deconstruct your faith. And we talked about what deconstruction means. Again, foundational issue there is the insufficiency of Scripture. Uh, well, then we consider the changing landscape in the fight for life. We talked about uh, the, the problem of, of life in America, how it's changed since the Dobbs decision, and how the church ha needs to catch up to that because now it's a different landscape in the fight for life. Last week, we tackled the popular trend of female headship and talked about the difference between egalitarianism and complementarianism. And so we looked at those two things. What does the Bible has to have to say about that? And again, foundational issue is the insufficiency of Scripture. If the Bible doesn't speak to it, then, you know, we can just do whatever we want to in the church. Today, we'll consider the pressure that the LGBTQ agenda has placed on the church, and we'll see what the Bible has to say about that. So as you know, <clears throat> my son and my daughter-in-law, and they're expecting their first child, the hospital where their baby's going to be born offered them an expectant parent class, which they attended, which brought up uh, wonderful thoughts to me of uh, the expectant parent class that Denise and I attended when Adam was ready to be born. And so I, I was very excited that they attended one and that the hospitals still offer those things. The hospital uh, where the child is going to be born offered them this class, and the very first presentation in the class was about inclusion and non-discrimination. To continue to attend the class, you couldn't use pronouns such as he or she or him or her. Mothers were, be were to be referred to as birthing persons, and spouses were to be called birthing partners, not husbands. Breastfeeding was changed to chest feeding. And male children were to be called babies with penises. Now, these were the rules for taking the class. You had to use that kind of language to take the class. This insanity has and is sweeping the country. You cannot watch a television program or a commercial even that doesn't feature some sort of LGBTQ character. Major companies are surrendering to the pressure and changing their marketing to include a sales pitch to that community. Major institutions such as the hospital system where Mrs. Smith will give birth have caved to the doctrine of inclusion. So today what I want to do is just look at what's happening, where it is in the church, and what the Bible has to say on the subject, just like we have been doing. So what's happening? In 2015, the landscape changed. Obergefell versus Hodges uh, was, the was the decision of the Supreme Court. And this decision uh, said that, or came out and said that bans on same-sex marriages or services uh, not recognizing a same-sex marriage carried out in another jurisdiction was unconstitutional. So every same-sex marriage now was, by the court, with one stroke, labeled a constitutional act. 
The court cited the 14th Amendment's equal protection and due process language. Uh, the court's actions swept over the nation. State and local ordinances quickly fell in line so that states now approved of and, and sanctify or san uh, sanctioned same-sex marriages and then uh, were able to recognize same-sex marriages from other jurisdictions. So everybody was on the same playing field. So I said this changed the landscape, 2015. In 2020, the Bostock versus Clayton County decision came out. The Supreme Court ruled that workers could not be discriminated against on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. This decision created an environment of expanding rights on the basis of sexual orientation. The overarching idea of this decision was, was uh, compassion, but what happened was with Bostock is that it, it opened the door for, for lots and lots of things to happen. For example, uh, Grimm versus Gloucester County School Board. According to the ALCU's report on the reach of the Bostock decision, they point to Grimm and say, and said that after Bostock, there's no question that if adverse unequal treatment of transgender students, including barring them from using restrooms corresponding to their gender identity, discriminates based on sex in violation of Title IX, the federal law prohibiting sex discrimination by federally funded schools. The Grimm versus Gloucester decision opened the door then for transgender uh, children to go to the opposite sex bathroom. I don't know if you heard the story this week about the, uh, the school board in Maine or Massachusetts. I think it was Massachusetts where they put up a tampon dispenser in the boys' bathroom. Because they're, they have to do that according to state law, that tampon dispenser has to be in so many female, transgender, and then male bathrooms. So they put one up in this boys' bathroom. It took 20 minutes for the boys to tear it down. And so, you know, we have, we, this, we have this friction going on because of that. Bostock opened the door for Grimm. It also opened the door for another decision called Doe versus Snyder. The ACLU report states, and I'm quoting them, Bostock's reasoning requires that the federal law prohibiting sex discrimination by federally funded health care providers be understood to prohibit unequal treatment of transgender patients. So now it's, it's in the medical system. They have decided that it has to be viewed a certain way in our medical system, which is probably why the hospital that Aaron and Lauren are going to have their child at <clears throat> were so insistent on certain language. Bostock has also given teeth to the federal enforcement of these laws and encouraged state protections in 60% of states. The Bostock ruling has created an environment where federal laws are read with these decisions in mind and they are influencing the ways future rulings and laws will be enacted. So we're not done. Bostock is not done. And more and more of these things are going to be happening. <clears throat> one of the, one of the um, troubles that Bostock has created is when it comes to transgender men uh, competing in women's sports. We all know how that's happening. Well, the, the problem that it's created is you have a, you have a ruling like Grimm that says, you know, it has, you, you can't discriminate according to Title IX now. If someone's transgender and they say they're a girl, then they have to be allowed. But then you have state officials saying that we can't allow that because it's destroying women's sports. And so there's, there's great tension now, even in, uh, even in the governance of states, over how to treat this thing. You've seen a lot of, I'm sure you've noticed a lot of um, laws coming out of different states to, um, to rectify that. So where is it happening in the church? Well, I, I came across this article written by Christopher Riano and William Eskridge, es, uh, Eskridge Jr., entitled The Unfinished Business of LGBTQ Plus Equality Five Years After Obergefell and Hodges. And this article, <clears throat> they make a statement at the end of this piece that I want to read to you. And these are not Christian, this is not a Christian publication that this article is in, and these aren't churchmen that are saying this. These are just researchers that are making a statement 
about the condition in the church today. Listen to this. They say, quote, We found a spirit of tolerance and often acceptance in exchanges with leading Catholics, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Latter-day Saints, Presbyterians, Reform and Conservative Jews, and Methodists. What same-sex marriage has done to open the door to these conversations has strengthened as opposed to weakened these faith communities because they will continue to face internal pressure from colleagues who plead for a warmer welcome for their own LGBTQ plus friends and relatives. Same-sex marriage may be changing religion, but it is happening as a result of pressure from the inside rather than from the outside of faith communities. Changing religion. And that's exactly what's happened since Obergefell. The pressure is now not only on the outside, and as I've said just in every single one of these sermons, but it's from the inside. And they, like I said, they're not churchmen at all, and they see it. That's it. The pressure is coming from the inside now. In 2014, there was a conference called the Reformation Project Conference. Now, 2014 is before uh, Obergefell, which happened in 2015. But this conference took place uh, in Atlanta, I believe, and it sent shockwaves through the church. The Reformation Project is a parachurch group. You can use that parachurch designation lightly a parachurch group whose stated purpose is to advance LGBTQ inclusion in the church and help reform the church's understanding of the Bible on the subject. And they are very bold about this, very bold about this. They want to tell you that the, the uh, orthodox understanding of the scripture on this subject is wrong, and they will tell you how it is wrong. The Reformation Project is still alive and well, but what they did set the stage for what's happening now in the church. Since then, a blistering number of churchmen and leading women have launched ministries to do the same thing. Among them are people like Tony Campalo, Colby Martin, Jen Hatmaker, Matthew Vines, and many others. And I hesitate to name them all because the list really is too long for me to name and I don't want you to go looking up their websites because they are adrift from the biblical standard. But that just tells us, that tells us something about the temperature in the church. Then, in September of last year, 2023, there was a conference held in Atlanta called the Unconditional Conference. This meeting was sponsored by Embracing the Journey which is another parachurch organization, and it claimed to be theologically neutral, but instead was affirming of LGBTQ lifestyle and critical of any theological position contrary to their own. And not surprisingly, it was held at Andy Stanley's church and featured him and two of his pastors as keynote speakers. I would just say, I put, wrote this in my notes, and I, I just think that it's a Trojan, her, Trojan horse meant to move the agenda along in the church because they said one thing about the conference and then did something completely different. So the point of all this is, number one, to force the church into acceptance of any form of sexuality or behavior. Since Obergefell, the culture has become hostile towards the church. The neutral space is now gone. Since Obergefell, the neutral space is now gone. Before, 2015, the decision, before the 2015 decision, everyone could have their own opinion on this subject, whether you liked it or not. But now all opinions must conform to this agenda. There is no more place for a divergent opinion. Number two, the point of all this is to question or reject the orthodox understanding of scripture, the historic teaching on gender and sexuality, and to adopt an insufficiency position. They want us to be able to say, oh, of course the Bible wants to uh, affirm this. To say the scriptures... Uh, that is to say that the scripture's clear declaration on this subject is false.
false. The third point of all this, I believe, is to force the church into the celebration of the lifestyle as directed by the world's changing standard of truth. And the fourth, it is evident to me that the whole point of this now is to silence those who disagree by marginalizing them through mob tactics, ad hominem attacks, and eventually through the force of law. I told you two weeks ago how there's, there's legislation now in Congress just waiting for the right temperature to force all the states to uh, allow abortion. That same kind of legislation, ladies and gentlemen, is in the back rooms now waiting for the right temperature so that these laws can be passed, forcing speech to be a certain way. It's not free speech any longer. I've said, I've said this for I don't know how many years now. It is certain speech. And silence is on its way. So what does the Bible have to say about all this? <clears throat> well, the Bible tells a similar story in 2 Kings about how the world crept into the worship of the Old Testament church. After the death of a good king named Hezekiah in uh, Second, or Second Kings chapter 20, verse 21, it says that he slept with his fathers and Manasseh, his son, reigned in his stead. Then Manasseh, his son, reigned for 55 years and he was a very wicked king. Second Kings chapter 21 describes his wickedness. And so I want to look at that with you just briefly and then we're, we'll move on to chapter 23. Manasseh was raised by Hezekiah, and he was a very good king, Hezekiah was. But somehow, that did not translate into his child, Manasseh. And what we find in chapter 21 of 2 Kings is we find this, his wickedness, and it begins in verse 3, because you'll notice in verse 3, he reversed all the good that his father had achieved. Look at verse 3. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed and reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel and worshiped the hosts of heaven and served them. But this was not enough for Manasseh. Notice that he, all, he did this to all the high places, all the altars. He reared them back up. Hezekiah had torn them all down. He had torn them all down in a great reform and had led all of Israel back. But now Manasseh comes along and he reverses all the good. He built up again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had destroyed. So he fills the land with altars again, but this is not enough. He goes on to dishonor the temple of God. Notice in verses 4 and 5 there in 2 Kings 21. He built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said in Jerusalem, will I put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. It is never enough for the rebellious heart to have its way. It must always impose itself on the worship of God. Because they are in rebellion against God. They hate all the threatenings of the Lord. And will reject them all. And they love all the good things that come from the Lord. Up to the point where they might be led to repentance. And then they use the goodness of the Lord and his mercy as a license for their sinfulness. And so they must impose their will on the worship of God. And he goes in and dishonors the temple. But he didn't stop there. Notice verse 6. He made his son pass through the fire. And observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He brought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. To provoke him to anger. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. So not only did he rear up all the altars in the land, and then he built altars in the house of the Lord, but he then made his son pass through the fire. We've talked about that before, the worship of Moloch. And he dedicated one of his children to Moloch. And that poor child had to die at the hands of his dear father. But he didn't stop there. Notice that he stained the worship of God by introducing immoral sexuality as worship into the temple. Look at verse 7. 
He said, a graven image of the grove that he made in the house of which the Lord said to David, to Solomon and his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever. The Asherah pole or grove was an image of the goddess Asheroth, a Canaanite deity who was the fertility goddess. And like most fertility gods and goddesses, her worship included lewd sexual acts administered by priest and priestess prostitutes. He did this in the house of the Lord. How come he could not be satisfied with his idolatry in the land? He could have gone anywhere in the land and worship, but no, no, he had to bring it into the house of the Lord. I think we can see the progression of rebellion from restoring all the wicked things that Hezekiah had removed to establishing altars in the temple of God in Jerusalem to child sacrifice and to all the darkness that he was engaged in and finally to bringing into the temple compound the sexual immorality of false worship. And the reversal in our day mirrors what was happening in Manasseh's day. It has come into the church. After Manasseh came Ammon, his son who walked in the same way of his father. He only reigned for two years, and then we have the reign of Josiah. And with Josiah, the Lord gave a revival. And if you wanted to read about that revival, look at First or Second Kings 22. And you know what happened in that revival? It's a wonderful story about the revival that took place in Josiah's day. All the junk now, just imagine, after Manasseh and Ammon's reign, all the junk that's in the temple. And we're going to see some of it as because Josiah's going to take it out. But all that stuff, and guess what they found in the temple? They found the roll of the book of the law. They found God's word. Somehow it was lost, and now suddenly they find it. And they bring it to the king, and they read it before the king. And the king tears his robes. And then the king has it read to all the people. And the people repent. And then there's this great revival simply because the word of God is now being read. So after Manasseh and Ammon, uh, you know, Ammon only reigned for two years. Manasseh for 55 years. So 57 years of this is going on. And then we have this revival that takes place. It starts in the king's heart. It's rooted in nothing more than a reading of God's word. And when the word of God gave clarity, the king and the people reformed their ways. So now look at 2 Kings chapter 23. And this tells a story about what the king and the people did. The very first thing, we find it there in verse 4. They cleansed the temple of all the items used for false worship. Notice this. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and the priests of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the hosts of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the field of Kidron and carried the ashes of them unto Bethel. Now, all that was just in the temple. It's in the house of the Lord. They had stored it there. So all the disgusting items that were used for Baal and Ashtaroth and for the worship of the stars, all of that was in the house of the Lord. They bring it out, first thing. Second thing, notice verse 6, 2 Kings 23, 6. Here they removed the grove, a rejection of the sexually immoral worship that had infected the temple of God. You notice there in verse 6 it says, And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem, under the brook Kidron, and burned it at the brook and stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereof upon the graves of the children of the people. So not only does he bring out all the items used for worship, but now he brings the idol itself out. He brings it completely out. The grove, which was nothing more than a pole that stylized a tree. That's how Ashtoreth was worshipped. He brings that out, burns it, and stamps it into powder. Then notice verse 7. The Sodomites are removed. And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. What in the world has happened? You have items for the worship of Baal and the grove and the stars in the temple. You have the very idol itself in the temple. And now it's right by the temple. You have the houses of the Sodomites built. How come? Why were they there? 
Manasseh had set up the grove in the Lord's house, therefore the priests of the grove needed to be close to perform their function. And so as Josiah broke down the houses of the Sodomites, based on a reading of God's word, it, well, and that's, that's what happened in the passage, but ladies and gentlemen, we are building the houses for Sodomites in the churches of our land based on a rejection of God's word. Instead of allowing the word of God to inform us and give us order and show us how to live, we're allowing it to just to pass away, forget about it. It's lost now somewhere, somewhere in a book, someplace that's dusty on a shelf. There's the Bible, but we're not paying any attention to it because now we're building the houses of the Sodomites adjacent to the worship of God because they need to go into the temple because there's their worship at that pole. And the male priests doing the things that they do with other men and the female priests doing the things that they do with the other women in the temple. And if the word of God is to be trusted, then it is high time that we say to the church in love, let's get it out. That's exactly what Josiah did. And we must remember that the broader issues of sexual immorality and the LGBTQ plus and all the rest issues are a result of idolatry. This is true in Josiah's day. It's still true today. The apostle teaches us that in Romans chapter 1, 23 and 24. And he writes, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts, creeping things, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. This is nothing more than a symptom. It is not the problem. It is actually a symptom of the problem, which is idolatry in hearts today because we're not worshiping the God of our fathers. Well, I don't know what it in the world is. We're worshiping the almighty dollar or the American flag or something. I don't know what it is. But it's causing this to happen among us. We're walking away, ladies and gentlemen. And when we walk away, the vacuum that's created allows all the rest of this mess to come in. And it's time for us to stand up and say the truth. So how do we apply what we've learned here in 2 Kings 23? Well... First, I just want to say this. We must stand for the truth of God's word and not be swayed by the insufficiency arguments of the progressive Christian movement. This means truth-telling. Joe Dokes was sick and suspected that something was wrong. He went to his family doctor who, after an examination, told Joe that everything was just fine. Joe asked about the pain and the weakness. The doctor told him it was tough growing older and that he would just have to get used to this new phase of life. Joe grew worse. He decided to seek the opinion of another doctor. After an examination, the doctor told Joe that he had cancer, but said not to worry that this was wonderful news, that Joe could now identify as a cancer patient. He said this was normal physiology. He was not in danger of dying, and Joe should embrace this condition with gladness. Joe grew worse. Finally, he went for a third consultation. After the exam, the doctor told him that he had a cancerous tumor in stage 3, but that it was treatable with surgical extraction and medication. Without treatment, Joe was going to live only six to nine months more. Who loved Joe more? The one who ignored the condition, the one who celebrated the condition, or the one who told Joe the hard truth about his condition? What doctor would you want to go to? It gives me no joy to point out the ruination that sexual immorality has brought to the world and is bringing to the church in our day. The apostate church, ladies and gentlemen, is on the ascendancy. But for us to love our brethren, our families, our community, and our nation, we must stand up and tell the hard truth. As the Lord said in Leviticus, it is an abomination. And it is not wrong for us to say that. 
Just like the prohibition against abortion, we defile our land by an open embrace of this sin. Finally, it does give me great joy to point to the cross and to tell the world that there is a remedy. While we stand for the truth of God's word, we must also proclaim the message of salvation that is only found in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God can diagnose the problem and offer hope to those struggling to find hope because the preaching of the cross is life. And that's what we must stand for. But ladies and gentlemen, also we must be ready because it's not going to get better very quick. And we must be about the business of standing for the truth and proclaiming the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ.